and this is a very popular passage of scripture I preached from here before, but I have a different um, perspective and revelation that the Lord uh, gave me about this. And I really pray that this not only helps us as a church, but that it helps you individually. God has called you to do something great for him. There's purpose, there's destiny over your life. And the enemy wants you to live in ignorance of all of those things. He wants you to live in the dark so that you cannot walk in what God has ordained for you to walk into. As soon as the light comes on and you know, all of a sudden you have to live your, your life differently because now you know. And tonight I'm going to share something with you that I believe is going to revolutionize our ministry because I believe this is where God wants our heart to be. And, um, and as we dive into this tonight, I want you to take notes. I want you to dig in and we're going to have a great time for the next 45 minutes. Amen. So go with me to Mark chapter two. I'm reading from the new King James version t uh, tonight. And we're going to read a little bit if that's okay with you. Beginning at verse 1, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Mark chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, it says this. And again, he, speaking of Jesus, entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there were or was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, Jesus, I just saw that. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes was sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in their spirit, in his spirit, that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed and went out of the presence of them all. So that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. I want to deal with the subject. Just one word is not catchy, is not fancy. Um, but it's something that we as a church has, have to grasp in order for us to see God move in this next season. And that one word is hospitality. Look at your neighbor and say, I need you to be hospitable. We started the series Reset because the Lord began to deal with me about the ministry. In Exodus chapter 3, uh, you know what? I didn't give that to them, but let's do this. Go to Exodus chapter 3. If you go to Exodus chapter 3, God begins to speak to Moses. When God is speaking to Moses about his assignment, the Bible says that God looks at Moses and he asks him a question. He says, Moses, what's in your hand? As is actually Exodus chapter four, uh, beginning at verse one, then, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, take it by the tail and he reached out and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. 
that they may believe that the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Now look at this. He says, furthermore, the Lord said, now put your hand in your bosom. And, he's, and he put his hand in his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And when he put his hand back into it, his, his, his coat pocket and brought it, out, brought it out, it was back to a normal hand. Now look at this. God said to Moses, I want you to use something that's in your hand, and I'm going to use what's in your hand as a sign to confirm the call. The confirmation of the call of Moses came through a stick. He said, the confirmation of your call is coming through your staff, coming through your support, coming through this stick that you will be able to use. And the stick, this rod that Moses would use, he would, of course, he would use it to lean on. He would use it to correct the sheep. He would use this to pull in the sheep. But the Bible says this. He said, Moses, the thing that's in your hand, I want you to do something. I want you to throw it to the ground. When he throws the staff to the ground, it turns into a snake. Listen, what happens is when you begin to take your hands off the things that God told you to keep your hands on, it has the potential to turn into something it was never intended to be. But what the staff does is the staff turns into something that Moses is afraid to address. So the Bible says Moses looks at the snake like I would have, and he ran. God said, no, 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 no. I know it turned into something else when it got out of your hand, but I want you to go back and address it. Because if you are afraid to pick up the thing I told you to put down, you will never be able to be a leader. So you have to put your hand back on your staff. You have to put your hand back on uh, the staff, the thing that's going to allow you to lead. And when he picks it back up, it turns back into the rod. And sometimes in life, when we become so busy and we let things go, things begin to alter. Things begin to change into things that we did not actually see um, that it could be dangerous to us. But God says, Moses, pick it back up. So you have to be able to address the thing that changed into something else so that you can get it back to where it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? So this is why we're doing a reset, because the Lord said, all right, Sim, you got to put your hand back on some stuff. There's some things that's not happening in the church, and so some people are taking liberties. I don't know anything specifically. I'm just speaking from a pastor, all right? Some people are taking liberties. Some people are saying they have your spirit and they don't know it. They don't know your spirit because they haven't been around you long enough. And so what happens is people will think just because you have a title or a position that you know exactly what the heartbeat of the ministry is, and that's not the case at all. I have not spent a lot of time with the leaders this year, very little, so this is not a jab at anybody. I got to put my hands back on y'all. Y'all got me? But I'm going to have to do with everybody at the same time because I don't have time to do a lot of meetings, all right? So I'm going everybody to get the same time. So Mark chapter 2. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2 that Jesus... He's in a Capernaum and it's heard. Somebody say heard. It's heard he's in the house, which means people are talking. See, that's the problem with the church. We're getting quiet. We have two voices in the church. It's a private one and a public one. The private voice is the voice that doesn't say anything. You praise God inwardly. You are appreciative of everything he's done in your life. You thank God you come and you give God praise when you come here. But when you leave through these doors, you do not share your faith with others. You do not share your faith with other co-workers. You do not share your faith with your neighbors, your family, or no one else because your voice is quiet. But God is requiring you to start speaking up about the things he's done for you. You can't offend somebody for being grateful. You you can't offend somebody for just being happy that God has been good to you. What are you happy about? Because my God is 
good. I woke up this morning. I came to work. You know, everything is fine. You know, I, I, I just, I'm just believing today's going to be a great day. I just feel good. It has nothing to do about the side of the bed I woke up on. I just, my eyes opened and I was grateful because this was a day that God made and I was going to rejoice and be glad in it. And people, when you are happy and you have that kind of energy, people are attracted to that. But as Christians, we have a tendency to walk around depressed, we have a tendency to walk, that, walk around looking stressed out and beat up, and we look like five miles of bad road. And we're trying to figure out why people don't want our God is because we do not represent him well. But the Bible says in Mark chapter 2 that the people are talking, but why do people talk? People talk because they've been impacted by what they've been impacted with. In other words, if you go to a restaurant and the restaurant serves good chicken, you can say, ooh, listen. It's a spot down the street around the corner that sells the best chicken wings you could ever think of. Nobody had to tell you to say anything about that. No one had to, to, to poke you in your arm to express how grateful you were for the fried chicken you just ate. And so what happens is, is when church becomes ineffective, we begin to not share. So it's our job to make sure that God's presence is here and that we are effective in everything that we do. And so we have to start talking. Somebody say talk. talk. All right. So I'm going to show you how you can share your faith in very simple ways. Number one, open your mouth and share. Just just this talk. You know, see, the problem is we, we think we have to come across deep. You know what I'm saying? Somebody says, man, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm good. Man, I'm glad to be alive. Just a great day. And I'm looking forward to what, what's going to happen. Man, you always seem to be happy. Why are you, why are you always happy? Man, you know, God's just been good to me, man. I've been through a lot, but he saw me through. And to know that I'm still here after everything I've been through, man. I, mean, I, I didn't survive cancer. I didn't been to five car accidents. I've I've, I've done this, I've done that, and, you know, God always makes sure my bills are paid and my family was taken care of and my kids are good, and, you know, I'm sitting here, I have nothing to complain about, and, you know, and if it wasn't for God, that, it was, that, was, that was easy. You didn't have to go, listen, hey, my God, I felt something. Let me tell you something while I'm, you ain't going to do that. <laughs> that. That right there going to turn them off. You, you, <laughs> you can talk simple. Right? Just sharing your faith. Number two, listen to me. I'm going to show you how we have to share our faith as a church. It is so easy. I need you to press a button. Either on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or any other social media platforms you use. It's called a share button. Okay, I'm going to give you some stats. For context, as of May 2019, the world's population is 7.7 .7 billion people. The internet has 4.4 billion users. There are 3.4 billion people who use social media actively every day. On average, each person in here has seven social media accounts. You spend two and a half hours daily on average on social media. <laughs> Y'all should say amen. I know it's not a scripture, but you can say that's true. All right. So anyway, 91% of retail brands use two or more social media channels. 81% of small businesses and medium businesses use social media platforms. Social media use, users grew 202 million people between April 2018 and April 2019. That means that somebody gets on social media every six seconds. Facebook Messenger and the WhatsApp handle 60 billion messages every day. What I'm trying to share with you is social media is a platform that God has given us in 2019 going into 2020 as a means to evangelize and to share our faith with others. And the only thing you got to do is share it. So what do you mean? I mean, if somebody has a testimony, I'm not talking about this church comedy that I really don't think is funny. Lady always brings stuff to me. She says, oh, my God, this is so funny. And she'll show me something, and I go, I don't think it's funny. I don't think what we think is funny in church, I don't think it's funny. And let me tell you why I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's funny because when I see it, I always see it through the lens of an unbeliever. 
That's why I don't think it's funny. Because even though if you look at it through the lens of somebody who's been in church, oh, it's hilarious. But when you look at it through the lens of an unbeliever, it's a turnoff. So what we think is a joke is foolishness to them. And they don't take our faith seriously because instead of you worshiping in church, you're recording it. If we streaming, why you got your phone out? I'm going to say it again. If we streaming, why are you recording it? Go back and watch it. But we'll have people missing moments in worship because they're trying to capture a moment. And so instead of being a part of the moment, you're missing it. It's, we going to reset. Because this is the moment, this is the time where you say, God, I need you in my life, and I don't have time to play games when I come here. I need you to move on my behalf. I need to be clear. I don't need any interruptions whatsoever. So I'm coming here to praise you, worship you, and I pray that you would speak to me in return. And so what has to happen is we have to understand the power of sharing our faith. And so when it comes down to a post or a scripture or a video or a sermon clip, that's a blessing that someone else has said. All you have to do is press one button and you share that the God knows how many people. And so we have to learn how to share our faith. And so here it is. We have to share our testimony, share our scriptures, share our messages. I'm so proud that in eight years, we've had 36,812 downloads on the app. So people all over the world have downloaded our apps, watching continuously. And this is one way we can simply share our faith. We have to take over social media. This is why we do tweet and greet. Some people, huh, I didn't come to church to take a picture. That's a sharing moment. Now, if you don't want to take a picture in church, don't take a picture at the restaurant. Don't take no more pictures of your food. Don't take no pictures of you speaking nowhere. Don't take no pictures of you in the bathroom talking about just got my hair done. Don't want to see it. If you can't show nobody you at church, don't post nothing else. So what are you saying? That's your private voice. It's a means because people will start saying, what is that? Every time I see you, you talk about this place. What is that place? Oh, it's my church. Your church? Yeah. Well, let me tell you about now. Yeah, let me tell you about my church. My church is here. It's that, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, before you know, you didn't rattle off and you started sharing. But if you never put anything out to at least pique somebody's interest. See, this is called evangelism. We don't teach this. This is why Christianity is dying in America. Because as church people, the only thing we do is come to church. Okay, let me move on to the next thing. And uh, we just move. All right, Mark chapter 1. Immediately, everybody came. They heard about Jesus. Verse 2, immediately the many gathered together so that, they, so that there was no longer room to receive them. Lord, please help me teach this. Number, number two, people want Jesus. It's a lie. We keep telling people the world don't want Jesus. That is not true. They want Jesus. They just don't want the Christianity we've created, which is very dogmatic and very judgmental. And so we have to unlearn some different things. Jesus came to help us. And if we're not careful, we will become modern day Pharisees. Now, if you don't know what a Pharisee is, a Pharisee was, was, was a religious group during Jesus' time, listen to me, who created additional rules and added that to the, to the scriptures and held their made-up rules on the same level as the scriptures. So we have rules like if you're going to come to church, you have to be dressed up. If you're going to come to church, you have to do communion every first Sunday. If you're going to come to church, you have to, women can't wear pants or women can't wear makeup. Or if you, if we're going to uh, come to church, church has to be at least four hours long. No, I'm serious. If you're not saved unless you did the following. And so if it, everyone has their list of things that qualify as it, if you're saved or not. And we created all of this stuff. And if you go to the scripture, you can't even find, you can't find none of it because it's what 
We created it, but we put it on the same level. And you know where we get our judgments from? We don't get it through the scriptures. We get it through the things we've been taught. And that's why it's hard. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a standard because some people are thinking, there's, where's the standard in the church? There's a standard in the church. There's, the Bible still talks about sin, which, which is disobedience to God's word. All right. The Bible talks about that. But we judge people through our lens, not always through the scripture. And the Bible says that people are hearing about Jesus and they're running to the house until it's full and that there's no more seats. There's no more seats because people want Jesus. If they don't want the other stuff. And so we have to learn to say, God, what do you want us to do? How do we minister to people in a time like this? It hurts my heart when people come here and we have to turn them away. So let me tell you what happens. You only have to be turned away about one or two times before you just say, I'm not coming back. But what's so amazing is some of y'all so hard headed that y'all won't move your seat. And so you make it harder for the ushers to get people on the row because you have a seat that has your butt print. That you've been sitting there for the same last six years. We've only been in the building about three, but you know what I mean. And so we have no listen. So let me tell you why this is difficult. It becomes difficult because when we are scattered all abroad in certain services and now people are at the door, they can't find seats. And then we tell them we have no more seats. You send them away, then I say, all oh, y'all sit down, and we end up having another 30 seats. But you know why they couldn't find one? Because y'all wouldn't slide down one. You know what? Since I'm here, I'm going pastor. Go to 1 Samuel. You're going to read this Bible tonight. 1 Samuel. <laughs> no, we're going to reset. Now, how many of y'all know about Saul? Saul was first king of Israel. God told him to go do something. He didn't do it. He decided he would do things his own way. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. I mean, that's verse 21. But the people took up the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of everything which uh, we have handled, uh, that um, the best of what should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel says this, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. But I need even a verse I want to read. I want to read 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So, when someone says, we need you to sit here, yeah. 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 and I ain't moving, witchcraft. Yeah. So you the one with the demon. So you're the one with the demon with a spirit of witchcraft operating in you because you, you came here to have your way. Yeah. Instead of coming here saying, God, how do I position myself to make sure we can get as many people in here to experience the presence of God as possible? Now, if you were sit in the same seat, I don't care. But what I'm saying is, if, <laughs> now, all y'all here, and this ain't, now, don't move. Can, can y'all just move down? You're like, I don't want to move. Okay. Now, this is middle of praise and worship. Can, can you move? Can you move? Now, now you got to deal with this. Oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, step on your purse. Oh, I'm so sorry. Was that your foot? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Just to get Lord Jesus. So now I got to use the restroom. Now I got to go all back down here. Excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Now, I'm small. And they were seated. 
Now, let's get you standing up. I need all y'all stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Now we play something, Chris. I need y'all clapping. Lift your hands. Worship being. All right. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. See, now you got to stop your praise. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank God bless you. All right. Excuse me. You got to stop all this. Excuse me. I got to get back out and preach. Now, that's comical, right? That's real funny. <laughs> that, now, it's not funny when you're in the middle of worship and somebody tapping you on your shoulder, talking about, can you move down? Why the ushers always tapping me? Because your witchcraft didn't move three seats down. Just slide down. It ain't a bad seat in the house. You can see the stage from every place in the... No, but, but we don't get that. And that's why I'm saying it, because sometimes you don't realize that that is a spirit of witchcraft. Now, it's only two options. You can stay there, or you can be constantly interrupted. Somebody posted on Facebook, I believe, somebody, you know, they, they do like the, the, the five star, four star, they like it or don't like it. Somebody said, I, I think somebody said, I liked it, but they just kept interrupting me. I said, I know what that means. That means you were standing or sitting in a certain place. You were probably on the edge and nobody was in the middle. And the ushers had to keep tapping you on your shoulder. They interrupt you to let somebody else in when all of that could have been over with if you just moved to the end of the row. There's no room in the house. I'm in the text. There's no room in the house. So how about let's have the ushers out and just follow instructions. To slide down to make it a little easier for them so we can get as many people in the room. Like the parking lot. Why y'all cussing these guys out over a parking spot? You cussing them out in the parking lot over a parking spot? Y'all give more respect to the Gamecocks downtown than y'all do to the house of God. And you cuss them out on trash ground? And then you expecting God to bless you. This happens almost every week. Why? Y what? But yet, you know why? Because in, in our minds, church, we're supposed to have it our way. And so we want everything to happen the way we want it to happen and everything is structured and not realize it's a bigger picture. The house got so full of people coming that there was no longer room in the temple, excuse me, the house, that nobody else could get in. And what was he preaching, Blanche? The word. This is the part. The word. When you preach word, people get free. When you preach word, people get free. This is why I'm speaking against this whole thing about witchcraft, because you think witchcraft is some, somebody in a dark room with talking about stuff and they got bones and skulls and, you know, and all. No, witchcraft, rebellion. Rebellion. You go in the military, I guarantee you won't be no rebellion. They tell you wake up at five and put your uniform on and you running three miles, you putting on your uniform and you running. Three miles. If they say 100 push-ups, it's 100 push-ups. Oh, you're going to eat this food whether you like it or not. But don't worry. We're going to work you so hard, you don't care what we put on that plate, you're going to eat it. But we come to church, and we change the way. I'm helping y'all. It's going to change. It changes the way we think. So now people are coming, and they're, they're coming to the church for the first time. Oh my God, I'm excited about coming. I want to come. And then they drive up. Somebody says, wave, hey, park here. They get out. Somebody, beep, I didn't want to park there anyway. Oh, we at church and folk cussing. All right. Walk to the door and nobody hugged them. Because you on your phone texting. Or people walking by, you can't get in the seat because what's on your phone is more important than serving in that moment. 
And we're missing because now we have become familiar. We become familiar with church that we don't take it as serious. So it, is, it doesn't matter if I hug you or not if you walk to the door. It's not a big deal. And I'm not against texting. I'm not against phone or all that. I get it. You need to text somebody real quick. I get it. But just look. You got to look. Got to pay attention. Nobody coming? Put it back. I get it. And I'm not trying to be your father. What I'm saying is if you're going to do that job, understand how important it is. Because there are people coming through those doors with all kind of stuff. The other day, I was so blessed. We were in the mall. Young lady was working. She stopped me. She said, Pastor, thank you so much. She said, the word has saved my life. I moved from another city and came here and met three different people at three different places. And the three people I met, all three of them went to the brook. And she said, I guess I got to go to this place. She said, one of them told me about the app and I downloaded the app and I was listening to the messages over and over and over on the app. I said, oh my God, that blessed me. And she said, she starts crying. And I was like, I'm trying to find tissue. She working, I'm trying to find tissue to give to her. It was, it blessed me, you know. So we're talking and she said, it just blessed me and God is helping me. And she said, I, but I didn't want to come because I was afraid that if I start, I wasn't going to be able to be consistent. Now, the thought that came to my mind is, who made her feel that she couldn't come, and if she missed it, that she couldn't come back? No, you may miss a Sunday, fine. Get back up. Come again. Keep keep coming. That's why we do children's ministry, because these kids need Jesus, because let's be honest, we ain't teaching our kids Jesus home. Because we're working too much. I'm not throwing stones. I'm telling you because we were so busy. There's certain things that we didn't teach our kids that we should have taught them. So I ain't even a stone throwing. Do you understand what I'm saying? So now what's happening is now the room is full. People are coming, but we got an issue. Now, Chris, I need your help. So Eli, Chris, I need you. Dennis, Ty, and said. Now, what happens is there's four guys who have a friend. I need Ty to be the one on the, uh, on the stretcher. I'm trying to make it easy for these guys tonight. So Ty, I need you to get on this stretcher. Now, Ty is paralyzed. So here it is, guys, don't pick him up yet. I'm gonna tell you everything to do. So what happens is Ty is paralyzed. And his four friends are saying, I got to get this guy to the brook. We praying because if he can get to the brook, if we can get him to church, God will bless him. We know it's going to bless him. We know if we can get him there, God's going to do it. So what they do, they say, we're in agreement. Let's do it. So all of them said, we get him on the cart and they're going to pick him up. And now they're getting ready to carry him. Now. Now, here it is. Now, in order for them to get to one place to the next, every single one of them got to be on the same page. All of them are saying, we got to get our friend to Jesus. If we can get him to Jesus, he going to be all right. If we can get him to church, he going to be good. If we get him to church, everything's going to be all right. They put him on. Now, during this time, they didn't have automobiles. They had, they had to carry him. So only God knows. Y'all start walking around. Y'all go to the drum set, and then y'all turn around, and then y'all walk to the other side. So now they got to figure out and maneuver how they're going to get him to the church. Now, at this point, they strong, they good, but the problem is we don't know how long they got to walk. Now, walk to the other side of the stage. Now, because they got to carry this guy. So now they're moving smart. They ain't going to turn around. They just, they just going to turn around. Praise God. You know? Right? <laughs> so now they got a strategy. Right? Go back to the other side. Keep going. That's back and forth. So now here it is. They're carrying him. We got to give him the church. We got to give him the church. He, if we can get him to the brook, God going to bless him. Then they get to the parking lot. And somebody cussing because they didn't get their parking spot. He and 
on the stretch and talking about what's, what's going on? <laughs> we had a game? Nah, we at church. But all of a sudden, they parked their car because it's already full, so they got to park across the street at the, at the archives. The bus stopped running, so they got to walk from the other side of the street to get over here, and it's 40 degrees outside. And they're trying to get in the church because they believe and they're doing whatever they got to do. Their arms getting tired, it's burning, the grip's getting loose, they're wiping their hands, and they bet not drop time. <laughs> they walking, right? Their arms burning, they're getting tired. And all of a sudden, stop, they get to the door. We ain't got no more seats. Oh no, the devil is a liar. We didn't pack this guy on this stretcher. And the usher says, <laughs> how many? Four? <laughs> Four? No, no, none. Whatever movies y'all use, none. No, no seats. Now, these guys, so, so now let me switch this. Because now everything you see in this hospitality you see them have a burden for them wanting somebody else to get Jesus so bad that they're willing to have their muscles burning right now. Hands sweating, back hurting, all of that, hoping that I will hurry up and finish what I'm saying so they can put him down. But I'm not done. Because now what they start saying is we got to figure a way to get him in. And the only way to get them in is to actually go up. What I should have done is had them start on the floor and make them climb up these steps. But since we already here, we're going to imagine they already took the steps. Now they got to lift him up. Now they got to get him on their shoulders. So now... They got him on their shoulders, right? So they don't know which direction they're going yet. They're going to figure that out. But they got him up there. <laughs> Just don't drop tie. <laughs> now, here it is. So they're saying, we got to get him to Jesus. They take him to the roof. Now they have to lift him, right? Get him to the roof. Here's the thing. They're doing everything they know to do to get this one guy in the church service. Now, the problem is we already got the mature people in church who've been here. So no one says, let me get my seat up. I'll stand on the wall. No, 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 no. I'm going to sit right here. And if they didn't get here at a certain time, Oh, well, and I'm telling you, that's the wrong spirit. You know what that says? Then we start saying stuff like this. I'm coming for all of y'all. What y'all start saying is what this guy here earlier. I pray you never late. And by the way, all y'all who are conveniently here earlier and all y'all who have friends who save y'all seats. And for some of y'all who got these little hidden places that you and they come in, they still got this secret spot, but yet you don't care about them, shame on you. Because what you're saying is it doesn't matter about the guy who really needs it. So you come late, you just got a hookup. And you'll have your child sit in the seat next to you, knowing good and well that child's going to be sitting in your lap, but you're only holding that seat right there because your friend is coming. And their arms hurting, shoulders hurting, trying to figure out how we gonna get this guy. And the reason why I got them holding it is because when you have a heart for people, it burns. It's uncomfortable, it's painful, and you're doing everything possible to make sure he's good. The, the thing is, ministry has been so easy for us that I haven't made demands from y'all that has made y'all lazy. Some of y'all lazy. 
So oh, all I ain't got to do is a little bit. Man, if we was in an old church and some of y'all, if y'all that if y'all that y'all past churches, y'all pastors ran over y'all so much. Y'all, it's ridiculous how much y'all don't do here compared to what y'all used to do. I know I'm telling the truth. So now because you got a way out, you take it. So you sign up and say you serving on planning center. Then the morning of, don't even show up. Don't send a text. Don't let nobody know nothing. Are you serious right now? We got this guy trying to get in the church, and you don't think it's important enough to say I'm sick or I can't make it? Now we end up. Now we all can you serve because such and such didn't show up, and now somebody who was came to get something now got to work today because they have the heart of the ministry while the other person home streaming watching it while they in bed because they didn't want to get up. Are you serious? And so you got the praise team, the band, ushers, media ministry, camera people, children's church, everybody trying to make it happen. And you will complain about something you don't see and will not contribute. I am telling you, that is not godly. That is... Do you know why I'm hot on this right now, Rita? Because the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, that a bishop, which is a pastor, must have the qualifications of being hospitable. If a pastor isn't hospitable, he's not walking in his office. It should get on my nerves when people are being mistreated. So now they appear like, Pastor, please hurry up. Now, you good? You sure? You positive? Not positive. Put him down. So now they go to the roof, they put him down, and what they start doing, what they start doing is now they start digging in the roof to get him to Jesus. Now look at this. If they're in the ceiling, that means stuff falling. That means it's getting messy. Because there's no way in the world, Blanche, you can do ministry and then not be some level of mess. What's all this? What's falling? Oh my God, can they hurry up? I don't want to clap no more. I don't want to hug my neighbor. I don't know them anyway. They smell like weed. Which you used to smoke five years ago, by the way. But we judge it. So, so we. <clears throat> See, because you get selective amnesia. So we try to get this guy to Jesus. They start ripping up the roof. All of a sudden. But you know what? No one cares about the guy on the outside because I'm already in. Oh, no, no. We don't want them kind of people here. No, we're already in. Lead them out. And we're trying to help people, but we're not because we don't have a burden to carry nobody but ourselves and our own bags. And so now, how do we gauge a, a great service? Did we get out in an hour and 15 minutes? Did they sing our song? Did pastor preach and he yell? Did, he, did the organ come on? Did we shout? Did we dance? And we have this checklist of things that we qualify as church. The Bible says that they tear off the roof for this guy. And when Jesus sees their faith. When he sees all of the work that they put into it, when he saw what happened in the parking lot, when he saw what happened with the first time guests and first touch and greeters, when he saw what happened in children's church, when he saw what happened in the music ministry, when he saw what happened with the ministers, when he saw what happened at the altar call, what he saw with security, what he saw with the youth ministry, what they saw with the media and the streaming and the so when they saw what happened with the faith of these individuals, he said, your faith and your commitment got him up. 
No, see, y'all didn't get it. Y'all missed it. It's what you do that determines what happens when they walk through the door. So if you off and you don't have the drive and the faith to believe that where you stand is an assignment, what happens is you're showing God you don't believe he's going to move into anybody else's life. So I'm not a ushering because I don't have nothing else to do, but I believe I'm a divine seat sitter. And I believe if I sit you here, you will sit by somebody who got the Holy Ghost and when they lift their hands, something's going to jump off on you because you need what they have. And I know you want to sit over there, but I felt led for you to sit over here. And I pray that whoever needed you over there, get what they need. You have an assignment. And so it's what they did to get this guy up, not what he did. It's what they did. So it's when y'all sing and you and you want the presence of God. It's when you guys dance. It's when you serve and find people's seats. It's when you serve the community and we're on outreach and we're doing all these different things. It's that that moves God's heart, not the paralyzed. Here it is. I, Nick, did you get that other slide for me? Put it on the screen for me. I want to share something with you and I pray this blesses you. I'll be done in two minutes, guys, and I'm going to let y'all go. I got something on the screen I want to share with you. I want all y'all to write this down. This going this to bless you. All right? It's two words. <clears throat> oh, you got it up there. I'm sorry. Disability. A disability, listen to me, is a physical or mental condition that limits a person's movement, senses, or activity. Tie in this illustration is disabled. Y'all got me? Put a handicap up. Handicap is a circumstance. Okay. The handicap is the circumstance that makes progressing, uh, the progressive success difficult. In other words, he's disabled, but the handicap is the church. It's the circumstance. It's the what happens in the parking lot can be the handicap. It's what happens when they walk in and experience you on first touch. That could be the handicap. It's what happens when they go check in the children's church or we mishandle one of their kids. That's the handicap. If you go to a school and a teacher do something with your kid, the circumstance becomes the handicap, right? So what I'm saying is you better make sure you're not the handicap. Don't be the one creating a situation that's holding back the disabled from getting to where they need to be. People are not handicapped. They're disabled. It's the situation. So in other words, if, if Ty was in a wheelchair and he wanted to be on stage, the handicap is we don't have a ramp. That's the handicap. So where's the ramp in the church? To get a person from the floor to the stage. Are you an elevator or what? When people come in contact with you, do they feel better? See, this is why we got to do this all over again. Because I'm not going to allow the enemy to come in here. With these wolves trying to come in and sneak in and cause division, thinking I don't see that. And this religious spirit that's coming in trying to cause stuff to plant seeds in the hearts of people to turn them away from a place that God has designed to help them. We ain't having that. And so we have to address the spirit head on. And so what happens is this. I'm going to share something with you that's going to help you. Now what happens is they let Ty down. Ty goes to Jesus. Jesus forgives his sin. And now when he comes to the church, he came, he heard the word, he received the word by faith because his friends brought him to church. Jesus says, get up. The man who was paralyzed now takes up his bed and says, thank you for everything you did. And now he walks out the door carrying the thing that he was brought in with. So 
when they're coming with all of these problems, listen, the problem isn't that they're carrying the problems. The problem is how you carry in that problem. See, some of y'all problems carrying y'all. But when you get control of your problem, you can, you can put it in the bag and walk around with it because it does not control you. He has the situation saying, this is not going to control me. And he takes it and goes home. Thank y'all. So here it is. Here's the challenge. Where's the four? Where's the four that says, I get it now. That's why we serving. That's why we here. This isn't about me. This isn't about you. This is about him. And he said, if I be lifted up, he would draw. The enemy wants to cause division. The enemy wants to cause division. So what begins to happen is people become, begin to move in ways to plant seeds to pull you away. Because what is happening, listen to me, if you're not careful, you will start com making comparisons with your current, with your ex. And what I mean by that is you'll start comparing what happened at your last church to this church. And we're not that. And it's all right if it don't work out. I'm cool. But I'm not going to be that. God has called us to help people. This is why serving is bigger than just something we do on the weekend because we have nothing else to do. We serve him because God has called us to help change lives. I appreciate all the volunteers. Everything you do, thank you so much. From the bottom of my heart, we couldn't do what we do if it wasn't for you. I appreciate the staff and those who work every day. Thank you for giving. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for being here. And some of this is a refresher. Some of this for the first time you're hearing it. But let me tell you, the reason why I'm talking so sharply tonight is because there's certain things we can't do. Listen to me. Hear my heart. You don't define excellence here. I do. And let me tell you why. Everybody doesn't have the same definition. If I, come here, Brother Jesse. Now, let me tell you something. This brother here is clean all the time. So I'm going to tell you how clean he is. He about, I hope you don't get mad at me. So let me tell you how clean he is. On his wedding day, he left the uh, wedding license in his car. So I said, man, give me the keys. I'll go get it. He said, no, no, Pastor. I said, look, man, I'll just give me the keys. I'll go get it. I don't have a problem with it. I'm, I'm good. So I go to his car. Car is sp spotless. <laughs> when I say clean, I opened the glove compartment, and the only thing in the glove compartment was this, this, um, this book, handbook. And then the wedding License was on top of it, set perfectly centered <laughs> in the glove compartment. I'm not lying. I'm not lying at all. I said, this dude, right, it was not one piece of dirt. <laughs> now, here it is. You ain't going to get in his car thinking you going to get in any kind of way. You going to knock the dust off your feet before you get in this car. I didn't even roll this car. Am I telling the truth? He set the standard for his car. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You set the standard of what excellence looks like in your home. God has set me as the one to define excellence here. So you do it this way, not your way. Because your definition of nice ain't my definition of nice. Thank you so much. I'm serious. You can't listen. Let me talk. Give me five minutes and I'm done. Let me talk to the business owners here right quick. You letting people do stuff in your business and you can't let them do that because they're about to tear up your brand. Listen to me. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel it strongly in my spirit. You got to get strategies and certain things so in tight. 
when they walk up to your counter or they walk into your business or if they answer your phone, how do they answer the phone? It ain't, hello, what's up, how you doing? It's not, hey, it's 809, how can I help you? They're supposed to say the same, everybody who answered the phone say the same thing. You don't say what you want to say on my phone. I pay you to say that. And I don't have to pay you to say that. I can pay somebody else to say it. Period. The doors open at such and such a time. That means you need to be to work on time. I don't pay you to be late. But people start taking liberties when they're not, when they're not supervised. Those are the ones you can't trust. They're good people, don't matter. So now what happens? The person has to handle your business like it was theirs. That's the one you can trust. I'm on time because I've bought into the vision that I want to make sure that I'm here and I'm doing everything the way it's supposed to be done because I believe in a brand. I believe how I'm supposed to do it. But if you are unclear on any process whatsoever, people will take liberties and you will end up paying for it because you did not train. Hear me? Same thing here. You walk to, you come in the parking lot, media, all that kind of stuff. And it's, I'm not trying to be a jerk. But if there's any place that's supposed to be excellent, it should be the church. We should be number one on everything. We should be the nicest people. Period. Come here, Dennis. So why can't we get more guys on the door, by the way? Why is it going to be all women? I love y'all, but we need some guys at the door. So a guy comes to the door, he always got to hug a woman. So if another guy's, hey, what's up, bro? How you doing? That's what we do. That's how we greet, right? Another guy. <laughs> another guy be like, hey, God, man, glad to see you. That ain't how we greet here. You going to grab, you going to dab, and you going to touch the shoulder. Got it? And if you can't, you ain't going to be at the door. <laughs> Plain and simple. Handshake, shoulder, other handshake, let go. That's easy. Three steps and you're done. <laughs> you can't have another guy come in. Oh, man, I'm so glad to see you. They're going to be like, oh, wait, hold on. I don't know you, bro, like that. See, that's why you can't make that much. Hey, hold on, player. I don't, know, I don't know you like that. He's sitting there stunned, shocked. <laughs> but Pastor me, we hug, in my family, we hug everybody like that. This ain't your family. That's why you don't, you see why you don't get the, the opportunity to define what, ex, you see what I'm saying? You'll do what you think, and it's like, that's the wrong thing. I was talking to somebody earlier today. And I was tired, and they asked me, they said, did you, did you read my bio? I said, yeah, I read your little bio. I mean, I read your bio. And they started laughing. They said, well, I'll make sure I correct my little bio. I said, man, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> the bio was short. You know how we do abbreviated? And I, went, I meant to say short, but I said little. And so <laughs> we were friends, so we good. We laughed about it, we moved on. But if I said that to the wrong person, they offended. Hospitality. Everything we do is based on hospitality. Thanks, Dennis. I'm over time. I'm going to let you go. But I want to do something right quick. I'm going to give you two minutes. Does anyone have any questions or anything I just asked? You don't have to be embarrassed. Any questions on anything I just explained or taught on? Yes. How you know you have the right four people carrying you? you? You know you have the right four people carrying you when they're willing to carry you and they don't want anything in return. Yeah. 
The only thing they want for you is the best for you. They just want to see you walk and live again. Another question? That's it. Love y'all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for the brothers. I pray that you touch their shoulders, their backs, their arms, their legs, their thighs. No pain. Father, thank you for your word and who you are in our lives. We pray that what's been said tonight, God, let it be received. Let it take root. Let it take growth. Let it grow in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits. God, we need to be the church you've called us to be. Let this be a house of order. We come against every spirit of division, every spirit of manipulation, every Jezebel spirit. We come against any satanic attack that may try to come to destroy the house of God. We thank you, God, that you're going to protect us. We thank you, God, that you're going to lead us and guide us. We thank you for the success that you've placed on this house and those who are connected to it. We thank you for increase. God, we thank you for insight and wisdom and revelation be poured out unto us now. God, we want your will to be done in this house. And Father, I pray you cover us, seal us, oh God, and we thank you for what you continue to do in our lives. In Jesus' name.